Hey, we wanna continue in our series about purpose, continue in how to make meaning of our life because God has designed you on purpose and he's also designed you with a purpose. And uh, we had looked at this last week by stating it that our starting point for purpose is not in a plan, it's in the person Jesus Christ. And we said it like this, our purpose is to know God and to make him known. And if you wanna really start to know your purpose, you start by knowing who God is through Jesus Christ. You start right there in this baptistry. By losing yourself, you're gonna find yourself. See, Colossians sets it up like this, and it says, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him, Jesus, and finds its purpose in him. And if you're trying to discover purpose outside of knowing God through Jesus Christ, you're never going to truly find that meaning and that purpose in life. Because purpose is not a plan. Purpose is a person. And it starts by knowing God through Jesus. And let me ask you the most basic question that so many preachers forget to ask, including myself. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Because knowing Jesus means to make him the savior of your soul. He's died for you so that you can have life eternal, but beyond that, your sins can be forgiven and you can have a relationship with God. It's not about religion. It's not about rituals. It's not about doing A, B, C, and D. It's about knowing Jesus Christ, receiving him, and allowing him then to be the leader of your life and to follow him by saying yes to him and no to yourself. Losing yourself, friend, you will find yourself. Jesus said, I die daily, be crucified with Christ. I no longer live, Paul says, but Christ lives in me. Do you know Jesus? That's the starting line. That's the runway, the takeoff to knowing your purpose. Outside of that, you will never really truly know your purpose. Okay, so let's say you've taken off now and you know God. Now, how do you make him known? Because that's the personal purpose that God's gonna lay on your heart. Some of you know that, some of you don't. Some of you have wrestled with this for a very long time. You have been made to make God known, to glorify him. How are you doing that? If you know God, how are you today making him known? Because that is the ultimate place where you're gonna find the most meaning. Because God is a designer. And because God is a designer, God is a creator, he has created you, wired you, however you wanna mention it. He has formed you for something. Here's how the scriptures say it in Ephesians. Paul wrote, for we are God's masterpiece. Don't you love that language? Because I don't always feel like that, but I'm thankful God sees me that way. He has created us anew, meaning he's doing something new in our life. In Christ Jesus, you get that newness from Jesus. So we can do good things that he has planned for us long ago. So if you come to Christ and you know God through Jesus, you're gonna become something new so that you can do good works, which God had already laid up long before you were born. And when you start hitting those triggers and you start getting to those waypoints and navigating your life there, you are gonna find incredible meaning and purpose in your life because God has plans for your life. You've ever thought about that? God has plans for your life and friend, they are better than the plans that you're creating right now for your own life. As a matter of fact, your better days are actually ahead of you. They're not behind you because that's who our God is. Here's how Jeremiah the prophet was told this by, by God himself. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Listen to this, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Now let's just look through this because I know you probably have this somewhere in your home. You've, you've seen this on a pillow or some kind of afghan or you've seen this on a plaque somewhere. This is such a famous piece of scripture, but so many of us have not put this in practical application. We hear that word prosper and all of a sudden we think of being successful with our finances, being successful with some kind of profit in our life. But really that word prosper has to do with peace. Not just peace of conflict, but peace from within. Friend, did you know that you can have conflict around you, but peace inside of you? But do you know where that comes? That doesn't come from what the world offers. That comes when you start with Jesus and you get to know God, you can have peace that surpasses all understanding and you can be prosperous then because you will be at peace. And it goes beyond just having peace with God and peace within. It's a piece of knowing that you are doing the right thing. It's about completion, that word is. Peace and completion. Then it goes on to say not to harm you. God's not looking for evil for your life. There, there's some myths out there. Some of you have this myth that God is making your purpose hard to find. Like you've got to go find a key, 
through a series of instructions. Then you go to go find the lock to that key and find the hidden treasure. And then once you open it, there's that mysterious purpose that you've always been waiting for because God has hidden it from you and he, and he delights in your confusion. God does not delight in your confusion. Matter of fact, if you're a believer and you know God and you're not discovering how to make him known, God, God is actually saying, that's not why I designed you. I, I, I don't delight in your confusion. I want you to know why I've designed you. You're my masterpiece. I've got good works for you. I've got some things laid ahead for you. I don't delight in your confusion. Purpose is not hard to find. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm here to prosper you, not to bring evil. I'm not here to harm you. He goes on to say, I've given you plans for hope and a future. I love that line, hope and future, because what that's saying is that God has more waiting for you than what you had behind you that you are made for more, that there's more in store for you when you know God and you start to make him known. So let me say it like this. Whether you're starting off in life, whether you're established in life, or whether you're trying to finish well in life right now. <laughs> you got it? You're not, you're, you're not too young. You're not too broken. You're not too busy. You're not too old for God to give you that purpose and to run with that purpose to the very ends of your life. Come to know who Jesus is. Meet with God and start now living for God by making him known. Your personal purpose is to make him known. Now, here's the waypoint that I'm talking about, that make him known side of it. There's gonna, you're gonna have to allow God to do something in you. And when you allow God to do something in you, he's gonna do something through you. And you're gonna feel that meaning and that purpose. But here's how you get there. Romans chapter 12, let's look at verses one through three. This is an important uh, important scripture as it relates to our personal purpose. Now, our general purpose is for all men to know God and to glorify him. But what, how are you making him known? How are you glorifying God? How are you making him known in your world? That's gonna look different for all of us. And Romans chapter 12, verse one and three tells us how to get this done. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. So he's talking to believers. He's talking to people who already know God. He's assuming now that we've all come to the starting point of knowing God. And now we're looking to make him known. I urge you to offer your bodies, now catch this, as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. That, that relates back to what Jesus had to say about crucify yourself daily and live for me. Put yourself to, to death daily. Lay aside your plans, lay aside your hopes and your dreams and all that stuff. And I know that sounds crazy to you, but I've got to, to lose myself to find myself and I'll lose myself to God to actually receive the purpose that he has waiting for me. He says, if you, you get to become a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So worship, friend, is not about singing. Worship is about sacrificing. And how are you sacrificing to show God your devotion to him, to show God that you're loving him, that you're worshiping him? Because when you start to sacrifice for God, you start to receive the purposes of the plan that God has made for you personally. And so he says in verse two, do not conform. That word conform is where we get our English word schematic. So do not, do not live to the plan, to the pattern of this world. I love that. Don't, don't live to the schematic design that the world is offering, but be transformed. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis, that something incredibly has changed, miraculously almost, divinely almost, like the caterpillar to a butterfly. That is a near miraculous change from those two different things. And God's telling us that that comes when you receive him, you leave the patterns of the world behind and you receive Jesus and God will do the metamorphosis. Hey friend, listen, some of you have ran ragged trying to change yourself on areas that were reserved for God to change because you can't do it when all you simply needed to do is say, God, here I am, change me. All you simply needed to do is to lose yourself so God could do a good work in you and you could find yourself. Continues on. By the renewing of your mind. So don't conform to the patterns of the world. Be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. Don't you all want to know God's will is for your life? Well, listen, leave behind the world's ideas of what purpose is about and start adapting and becoming changed by God even in your mind to see what God's will is because it's a good and pleasing, perfect will. You'll be able to discern what God's will is. Now listen, next week is an important sermon because we're gonna teach about three different circles that can intersect so that you can really focus on something that God has planned for your life. Right now, I'm just kind of on the outer rings of the bullseye. You know, we're just trying to target in today, 
But a lot of us have these transportation questions like where are we and how do we get there in life? When God says no, it's not to be obsessed with the transportation questions, it's to be obsessed with the transformative questions. God, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? Because that's what Romans is teaching us. Who am I becoming right? Who are you becoming right now? If your identity is Jesus Christ, are you becoming like Jesus Christ? Because that's where you're gonna find the sweet spot of your purpose. That's where you're gonna find the personal purpose stuff. Let me define it like this on the screen. The world's way is about what you do. God's way is about who you are. The world is saying, what are you gonna do with your life? What are you gonna become with your life? God is more interested in who you're becoming right now. Are you, are you leaving behind yourself and saying, God, it's about you. It's about losing myself to find yourself. Let, let me just state it like this. God's personal purpose for my life will be more about who I am than what I do. It'll be about more about who I am and what I do. And here's what God knows about us that you may have not discovered yet in this world is that God has more care about your identity than your activity. He cares more about your identity than your activity. Some of you think that God only cares about activity and he doesn't care about your identity. No, God says, if I can get you to understand your identity, that will direct your, your activity. For once you know your identity, you will have no questions about your activity. My dad tried to do this for me as a kid. Your dad, your mom, I don't know, someone probably tried to do this in your life too. Everybody would be doing the wrong thing in my circle of friends, you know. My dad would hear about somebody cheating on a test. My dad would hear about someone driving too fast to the neighbor, whatever it was, okay? He would hear about something and he'd look at me and say, Matt, that's not what we do. Merrill's don't do that. I, I didn't know what Merrill's were supposed to do or not supposed to do. I had to have it be defined by my dad. That was him loosely teaching me your identity in this family. This is your activity. These are the do's and don'ts. These are your activities. Now, that was my dad trying to loosely explain to me that my identity is going to create for me my activity and not the other way around. And what we have to do, according to Romans, is, is to lose the schematics, the plans, the ideas, the dreams that the world has put on us. And we have to allow God to metamorphosize our life. Friend, that's not an action that you do. That's an action that you allow God to do through you. It's something divine. And you say, God, would you change my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength for the things of you rather than the things of this world? That's where the losing and finding yourself stuff starts. And that's how you begin to make him known and finding that tremendous personal purpose that God has in your life. You've got to, you've got to gain the identity of Jesus and lose your identity. Because when you lose the identity of Jesus, I, I guarantee it, friend, you're going to go back to the old activities of the old way of the old man, of who you once were before you met Jesus. Can I explain to you, like, maybe more, more practical. Jesus made it practical. I'll make it practical for you. Jesus made it practical in a story in Luke 15. It's a story of lost things, a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost boy. And many times we talk about the grace and mercy that exists in that story as God receives lost things back. And that is so true. But in the story of the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son in Luke 15, it's not a story just of lostness. It's a story of the loss of identity of this child. What does the boy do? He is under the care and the protection and the provision of his father. And he says, dad, I want to go make a way in this world. I want to live to the schematic, the plan of this world. And I want to go find myself. So what does he do? Dad, would you please give me everything that I'm entitled to in the, in the will? And so dad bombards him with all the things that the world says you need to make your way in this world and to be successful and to have meaning and purpose. He is lavished with money. He's lavished with authority. He's lavished with power. And he goes out and he makes his way in the world. And what happens? He loses first his identity. He loses first that he is a son of his father. And then he loses his money. He loses his meaningful uh, friends. And, and then he loses his purpose and direction. And where does he end up? He ends up in the mud with the pigs. What a symbolic metaphor that when you go your own way and you follow the schematic, the plan of the world for purpose, you're gonna, lend, you're gonna find yourself stuck in the mud, frustrated thinking you found yourself only to find out that you found nothing and you've gained nothing. You have gained the whole world, but you have forfeited your soul. So what does this young boy do as he's lost his identity? Well, he did what so many of you, or maybe not so many, a few of you need to do. He came to his senses. 
And it says, he got up out of the mud and he said, I'm just gonna go back home because that's where my identity was. And when I had my identity, I had meaning and purpose. And he comes back home and his dad's waiting for him. His dad runs and gives him a big old hug. But what does his dad do next? Do you remember the story? His dad says, put the robe on his shoulder. You now have authority in this family. Put the ring on his finger. So important. The signet ring of the family. You're now back to being a son. You have your identity. And put sandals on his feet. You've worn, out your, you've worn out your old shoes walking the old way of life. Let me give you a pair of new shoes so you can walk in the right way of life. And that story is not just about God's grace and mercy and welcoming back sinners. That story is about someone who said, I'm gonna go search the world over for my own identity, find my own meaning and purpose. And when I didn't find it, I'm gonna come home to God because that's real identity is found. Some of you need to come back to God and find the real identity because you're stuck in the mud and you're frustrated with it. And you need to come back and you need to just receive who you are in Christ Jesus. Your identity is and your activity is you are, you are in Christ. Therefore, godly people oftentimes do godly things. And your identity will determine your activity. Friend, life is not about finding yourself. It's about finding God. That's what it's about. And once you've found God is recognizing, here's who I am in God, and here's who I am made for and made to do. And what you're made to do is to make God known. And sometimes we just lose track of our identity. There's a lot of us in this room. I mean, isn't that, the, isn't that right now the crisis of our culture in the United States? We are losing our identity. We have male, female, and then we have how many, how many other genders are there now? I don't know. I'm losing track of all this. We're losing our identity. And the more that we lose our identity, the more that we're going to lose our activity. And, and I think that's a plot of Satan. He knows this about our world. He knows this about ourselves. And, and God is desperately crying out to you, come back to Jesus Christ, lose yourself so that you can ultimately find yourself and find your identity. Because here's what Peter has to say, and I love this, because let me just remind you who are in Christ, your identity. Peter says, you are a chosen people, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Because you know your identity, you can do these activities. For he called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. You once had what? You once had no identity as people. Now you are God's people. You know your identity now. So from time to time, too often, I try to follow the schematic, the plans of the world. I sometimes lose my identity and I forget who I am. And I just go by who the world says I am or who I say I am. And I forget who God says I am. And when I forget who God says I am, I'm going to lose my identity. So let me just take a moment based on first Peter and just kind of tell you who God says you are. If you know, if you know God through Jesus, because the same is true for you. You are a new creation. You are called holy by God. You are empowered by God's Holy Spirit. You are forgiven and friend, you are free and you are found and you are saved and you are secure and you are safe and you are never alone and you have nothing to be ashamed of and you have nothing to be afraid of. You are chosen by God. You are called by God. You are a worthy of God because of Jesus Christ. You are gifted and you are wanted and you are victorious and you are royalty of the highest royal order and you are equipped to do every good work in the name of God and you are blessed and you are indeed a blessing and you have a heavenly home. And because you are what? Your identity. You're what? You're what? You're a child of God. That's who you are. And once you know that identity, absolutely. Once you know your identity, you can know your activity in this world. You can know your activity. And when you discover that, you'll discover that personal purpose that so many people are after. Once you get back to knowing God and making him known, you'll find out how to specifically make him known, how to glorify him in this world. The special purpose, the special passion that God's placed on your heart. Can I tell you why I know that? Back to Ephesians 2. It's simple. For we are God's handiwork. God's created us. Another version of the scripture. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? To yell it out, to do good works. We know our identity. We can have an activity. And what's that activity? Well, there's God's planned some things in advance for us to do. And I know the question, the big question would be now next, if, we're, if you're following along rationally, that, well, then what are the good works? What God, see, Matt, that's where I'm stuck is what are the good works? And here's, where I want to start to narrow this in. And this is part one today, part two next week's like cliffhanger. You're gonna hate me for it. 
And, <laughs> and you're going to be like, I have to come back. Yes, you do. You have to come back. Here's where you start to define this. And let me start to shape this. Let's go another, another ring of the bullseye in, to the bullseye in. Your shape will point you towards God's per- personal purpose. Your shape. Let me explain it like this because we're all shaped differently. This comes from what Job had said to God. God, you had shaped me and you made me. Job looked up to God and said, I know that I'm different than everybody else. And we're all like snowflakes. Each of us is different and none of us are alike. I get that. Rick Warren, I think it is that said, here's the acronym for shape. We've used this so many times before because it's so good. If you want to figure out this, this passion, this personal purpose that God's laying on your heart, here's what you need to know. Here's the five things you need to know. Spiritual gifts. What is your spiritual gift? A lot of you are like, look at you guys looking at me. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to tell you how you can figure that out. Spiritual gift. Heart. You, that you probably know. What's your passions? You know your passions. It can even be like, hey, I, I jet ski, man. That's my passion. We're going to figure out next week how you can use jet skiing, personal passion, to give God some glory. It's possible. Okay, abilities. Many of you know your abilities, your personality. Many of you know your personality, hopefully, unless you have multiple personalities. I shouldn't laugh at that. The, the other side of me said, don't laugh at that. And then experiences, how God has shaped you, informed you, and just kind of has molded your life. That is even the past that you are not proud of, but are humbled by because God has taken you from it to become someone new. How has God shaped all that stuff in your life? Those are the things you need to know as you look to discover that personal purpose in your life. And then we're going to talk about the sweet spot of that next week because because how God shaped you, it's gonna give you a heartbeat for some th- certain things in this world on how you can glorify God. Because not all of us in the same room are indignant about the same things. Like I recognize my wife and I, we have a passion for, for the, the, the fatherless, the foster kids in our communities. And just because we do doesn't mean you do. Because if we all did, then, what, then there would be things that would be neglected as well. And so we all have different heartbeats. We all have different passions. We all have different things that anger us righteously for things. You get what I'm getting at? And you have to know what those things are. And some of you are like looking at that spiritual gifted stuff and going, what is that about? Every believer has a gift that's been given to them by God so that they can empower the church. They're not meant for you. They're meant for, they're meant for me. And, and my gift's not meant for me. They're meant for you. Look how 1 Peter chapter 4 says it. God has given each of you a gift from the great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them to serve one another. My friend Max Burkhart, Mr. Front Row right here. I love Max. I've known Max for 20 years. He and Matt Hill, another buddy of mine, came walking in from the parking team. I love parking team people. I do. They're my salt of the earth kind of people, my kind of people, my kind of humor, parking lot people. And Max comes in and I just kind of razz him a little bit with, with, with uh, Matt as they're taking off their beautiful garments of reflection. Your coat, you're clothed in a coat of many colors. You just remember that next time you want to argue with me about this. And Max looks at me and he says, well, you couldn't, you, 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 you couldn't do your job without us. And I said, you are right. You park them and I preach to them. That's the way this works. I mean, you, you, he's absolutely right. I could not do. And Max, he, and I, I'm sure he knows this about himself. Max would have, if in a biblical terms, he would have a title of deacon here. He's leading ministry. That's a deacon. And Max has the gifts of help. You believe that? Okay, just reconfirming because we've confirmed this a few times. And he has the gift of administration. That's why he's leading. Those are two spiritual gifts that you find in the scriptures. You're saying to yourself, I don't know that about myself. You maybe have never one confirmed it in you because you haven't been around enough Christians to confirm it. Or two, You've never discovered this about yourself because you've never gone to discover Bethany. Because you're like another friend of mine who sat here and said, why do I need to go to that? I already know everything there is to know about Bethany. And I said, oh, but there's so much more. And he discovered, oh, you're right. I discovered my spiritual gifts and I also discovered new friends. (laughs) That's what you find at Discover Bethany. Because if you just go to Connection Central and you tell those folks, hey, I want to be a part of the next Discover Bethany, they're going to lead you to more than likely what your spiritual giftedness is and how you can best serve in the church and really find that place of passion that God's laid on your heart. You see, the avenues are there. Uh, Purpose is not hard to find. Some of us are just not willing to step step into it. And so I wanna just close by this, this point. Saying yes to God daily is the fastest way to discover your personal purpose. I could, this is the way it works. Okay, I know I'm going to stomp on some toes, and I get it. There are so many things that you don't need to pray about that you use, can I pray about this, as a, as a way to say no 
so you can say no later? Do you, honestly, do you really need to pray about if you should go to Discover Bethany or not? When you know your identity, you should know your activity. Do you really need to pray about if you should help your coworker move in to their new home? When you know your identity, come on, man, just wear the WWJD bracelet again. You know your activity. Do you really, do you really need to pray about if you should serve somewhere that God seems to be like kind of prodding you to serve in in the church? It might even be the nursery. <gasps> when you know your identity, and you know your activity. Do you, really, do you really need to pray about, should we join a small group, sweetheart? Well, let's pray about, no, no, no. When you know your identity, you know your activity. Maybe we should do this thing called rooted. It's like kind of the next level of small groups. It's not, but that's how it's kind of been told. It's not. It, should we mature in our faith? That's really the question you're asking. Should we mature in our faith? When you, <laughs> when you know your identity, you know your activity. I don't need to pray over this. What would Jesus do right now? Should I help this person on the side of the road? Well, I don't know. Let's pray about it. No, no. When you know your, are you catching it? You know your activity. You see, I, I didn't discover this until I was 17 years old. Some of you are discovering this right now. I had a pastor look at me and say, you need to start saying yes to God more instead of no. And he referred me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's a story where a young boy named Samuel, who becomes a great prophet of God, is told by his spiritual mentor, Eli. Let me just read it to you. So Eli said to Samuel, go lie down again. God had been calling him. And if someone calls to you again, say, what's the response? Yes, Lord, your servant's listening. And I had a pastor at uh, my junior year of high school say, you need to start saying yes, Lord, more instead of no, Lord. Because he discovered about my life that I was just creeping by in church and trying to do the bare minimum like I did in school and like I had been doing in life. He said, you need to say yes, yes, Lord. And when I discovered to say yes, Lord, more often in my life, I got to define what my purpose was because I got to see the things that I was good at and the things I wasn't good at. And so many of you have said no, Lord, to so many things that you don't even know what it is that God could be shaping you up to do. Like I said yes when I was a kid to be in the nursery. I said yes to the parking team. I said yes to making coffee. I said yes to running slides. I said yes to ushering. I said yes to teaching sixth grade boys as a junior in high school. I said yes to going and working in orphanages in Mexico over the border uh, once a month. I said yes to all these things. And once I discovered, and there's a lot of things that, man, I'm like, no way, I'm not for the orphans. I'll tell you that, I'm not going down there again. Or I might be like, you know, I'm not going to that nursery again. Or you know what, that parking crew, those guys are too rough. I can't handle you guys. <laughs> I found out of all the things that I said yes to, teaching sixth grade boys Though I didn't think it was a passion, and it's not, wow, I found a whole lot of purpose. I had that sixth grade teacher who I taught with look at me and say, you're really good at this. And I think you need to preach somewhere. And so he gave me an opportunity to preach in our youth group. And then that led to another thing that I got to preach at. And even though my passion, you may not know this, my passion is not preaching. It became my purpose and it makes so much meaning to me. But beyond, beyond just beyond just preaching. And then one day after saying all yes to all this stuff and the little things, we all want God to have this booming voice to us, but that's not how God speaks. God speaks in the whispers. He spoke to in a whisper to Elijah, spoke, spoke in a whisper to Zechariah, spoke in a whisper to Ananias when he had to go baptize Paul. He'll speak in a whisper. You all want a booming voice. That's not how he comes. He speaks in the whispers. And then when he has to shout at you, he really gets your attention. And one day he shouted at me and he got my attention. And I didn't have to pray about becoming a pastor. With such a major life, I didn't have to pray about that. I knew my identity by that time. And I knew what my activity was going to be. Now I fought that. I started out like Samuel. Hey, Lord, here I am. Send me. Yeah, I'll do whatever you want. He said, go to Southern Indiana. And I said, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. Not, you're crazy. And so my story became like Jonah in that morning where I felt like I was swallowed up and spit out on the shores of Southern Indiana. And I thought, what am I doing here? Why here? Because here had been my prayer since a time of being a little boy. God, give me great influence so that we can do amazing things in your name around the world. And in my arrogancy of Southern, Indi Southern California, I never thought you could do that in a little place like Southern Indiana. Just so you're aware, my county that I grew up in has 4 million people in it. The state of Indiana has 6 million. And so I pictured this place as a little place. 
in a rural place. And Bethany Christian Church, are you kidding me? A church of about 80 or 100 people. Is this really where you want me? And, and my elders know I fought that call for three, four years until I finally just realized this is your identity. Embrace it. You know the activity that he's called you to do and you're gonna go wherever he sends you. And once I, I adopted the identity and started saying yes again to God, that influence came. Friends, I would have never dreamed, and you didn't either, that we would be such an anomaly of a church. Just based on our size in the world, we're in the one percentile of churches. That, that's hard to believe, especially when you put it in a rural context. It, we, there's about 10 of us like this in the United States. Large church, small town. About 10 of us in the United States. I would have never have dreamt that God would have given me the influence that I have now amongst so many uh, movers and shakers in the faith. Would never have dreamed that. I thought that was reserved for big places, not little places. But once I started saying yes, I had to reserve the fact that there are no little places in God's sight, that there are no little, there are no little purposes, there are no little ministries. And then what God calls you to, you'll find significant meaning in. If you'll just lose yourself, you will ultimately, you'll ultimately find yourself. And I've always prayed, give me that influence. And God arrived. And friends, I, it would have been a hard no to Bethany Christian Church. It would have been a hard no to preaching. And it would have been a hard no to pastoring. If I would have never have said yes to all the little things. Because I said yes to the little things, I was able, and it was easier to say yes to the bigger thing. And I want that for you. I want you to start saying yes today because God is establishing some good things for you and you've been saying no for too long. And the first yes I want you to make is a yes to Jesus, to know him, to say, I'll lose myself to find myself. I'll be baptized in a watery grave and say, not my will, but yours be done. I will crucify myself daily so that Christ will live in me and I will be metamorphosized to live for him. And friend, that moves you to that starting point of knowing God and will move you to the next waypoint of knowing who God is by saying yes on a daily basis. And it's like the little steps of faith lead to the big steps of faith. But can I warn you that the, the path of least resistance, the path of least resistance for you just to walk out of here, do nothing with the message will never lead you to your purpose. Comfort will never lead you to your purpose. He's called you to do something. He's asking you to do it. And today we're just gonna ask you to do one of two things. Either be baptized into Christ and to know him or to head to Connection Central and find out and discover ways in which he can be known. Will you pray with me? God, you're good to us. And I know that there has been a portion of this message where its toes were just stomped on. Will you do the healing? Father, would you give us that passion that has burned maybe brightly in us once? Would you have that return to us so that we can help to identify that personal purpose? Father, maybe there are prodigals in the room. May they return to you because they're stuck in the mud and they're frustrated. May they come back and receive their identity in Jesus. There's so much that you can do within us. There's so much work ahead of us. Father, we want to do it with you because we know that will be meaning, meaningful and purposeful. So help us. Help us to remove the obstacles. Help us to remove... Uh, the, the times we say no and how we've been conditioned to say no, Re remove from us the schematic, the plan of the world, and may you, may you radically change our lives so that we say yes to you today. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen.